All right, thanks so much everyone for tuning in to the antimicrobials in the time of coronavirus talks. Um, I'm the second talk and I'm gonna focus on quaternary ammonium compounds. So just a little bit about the basics, quaternary ammonium compounds, you can call them a number of different things. I call them quacks, some people call them QACs, some people call them quats. Um, I'm not sure there's really a, a difference in what you call them um, as long as you kind of know, know what they are. So they're basically surfactants. They have a positively charged nitrogen that's surrounded by four groups that can vary depending on the subclass. Um, and on the right side of the slide, you'll see a number of different structures that might give you flashbacks to organic chemistry, but really are just meant to, end, um, to kind of show you the wide variety of structures that these classes can, that um, these compounds can have. So it's a one large class of quacks that have a lot of different subclasses grouped together because of similar um, structures. And a lot of the compounds within the larger class have at least one long carbon chain. So that carbon chain can go from anywhere from eight to 18 or even more carbons long. And what that really means is that plus the positively charged nitrogen makes these compounds really sticky or particle reactive. So they stick to surfaces and they stick to sediment um, and it can make them really persistent as well. Um, and many of these compounds are high production volume chemicals, um, over 1 million pounds per year. And I'm sure that that amount is going to go up this year. Um, so in terms of what products they're used in, um, each of the subclasses has different kind of subtle um, attributes that make them better for different types of products. But some are used as antistatics and softeners and fabric softeners um, and hair conditioners. Um, some are used as a preservative in personal care products, things like body wash, shampoo, cosmetics, lotions. And an example of this is quaternium 15. And what's a little um, alarming, I guess, about that is that it's not, the way it becomes a preservative is, is not the quack itself, it's that the quack is a formaldehyde releaser. So it's releasing formaldehyde into the product and acting as a preservative that way. Um, and then there are, of course, some pesticidal applications. It can be used as an herbicide. Um, it can kill, help with an algicide for your pool, a more typical kind of agricultural purposes. But then the products that are most relevant to the discussion today um, and those that you're probably sick of hearing about and or wish you could find in the store um, are those where it's used as an antimicrobial and cleaning products. And these can include things like surface cleaning wipes, um, hand soap, it's actually, um, Roth helped usher in the FDA ban on triclosan um, and hand soap a couple of years ago. Um, and what at least I've noticed is that a lot of those, in a lot of those cases, quacks or benzalkonium are being used as a replacement for triclosan um, in those antibacterial hand soaps. Um, they can be used as industrial cleaners, like janitorial kind of situations or industrial um, cleaning situations, as well as laundry sanitizers. Um, so there's been a lot of attention growing, I guess, about quacks given um, the coronavirus pandemic. I saw this article um, a week or so ago in Chemical and Engineering News talking about um, the supply and demand of quacks, about how the wipes and sprays and things are selling so fast that um, those that are making these compounds are actually struggling to keep up with the demand. Um, and that's not surprising. Um, Ted did a great job of introducing um, List N from the EPA which is the list of disinfectants that are approved for use um, in disinfecting with the coronavirus. And if you look at that list of the 392 entries that were on it when I looked a few days ago um, that are approved for use for that purpose, 205 of them have at least one quack in them. Um, so there's definitely a high demand for these compounds right now. So a little bit about the toxicological concerns, um, just to preface this with that I am not a toxicologist, so we'll be covering this at kind of a high level, um, but you can go to, to one great resource is the Biomonitoring California March 2020 meeting page, the link's here and I think hopefully sent out. Um, that's got some great background materials and a little more in depth about this. But leading off with the aquatic side of things, um, because that's my kind of background and happy place, um, we know that there are biocidal and herbicidal properties associated with these compounds. Um, so the fact that it can kill algae in your swimming pool means that it can almost certainly kill algae um, in the lake or the estuary where it might end up. 
Um, there's acute and chronic toxicity concerns. And I will note that um, for all these toxicity concerns, it's not necessarily for the entire class. Um, it might be for subtypes of quacks within the larger class. Um, and actually data on the entire class of quacks um, can be sparse relative to some of these subclasses. Um, and in that same vein, there is le less research available on toxicological concerns in sediments. As we talked about, um, these compounds are really sticky um, and they can end up in things like sediments in the water, at the bottom of the water column. Um, and the top right is one of my favorite pictures of sediments in a marsh um, off the coast of South Carolina with the little snails making their um, little mazes in there. Um, and there's not a lot of research on potential impact to these sediment dwelling organisms as a result of exposure to quacks. And then on the human side, um, Ted mentioned the um, occupational asthma and the fact that it's a sensitizer for asthma. Um, we know there's cases where the use of quacks and cleaning products has been associated with asthma, um, particularly in um, occupational settings. And then there's the laundry list of concern for human toxic um, impacts, dermal irritation, respiratory effects, nervous system, reproductive and developmental effects, immunological effects, altered cellular function, and effects on metabolism. Um, so kind of on the flip side of exposure, um, toxicology is of course the exposure. So we know, as I mentioned, that quacks can really stick to surfaces in the indoor and the outdoor environment. So they can stick to sediments and soils in the outdoor environment. And in the indoor environment, they can stick to the surfaces where they're applied. So if you use a wipe on your kitchen counter, for example, those quacks are probably going to stick around for quite a while. Um, actually, in grad school, we had a local hospital call because one of their workers was um, having an adverse reaction to the quacks used in their cleaning supplies. And they, they couldn't get the quacks off of the surfaces in her office. And so they were calling us um, trying to figure out how they, were, how they could get the quacks off. So they are really sticky um, and there could potentially be um, exposure there because they're really sticking around. There are also, of course, cleaning products. You think of their use as sprays. There's aerosols being generated. So there's the potential to inhale them, um, breathe them in when they're aerosolized. Um, and then they do go down the drain. So a lot of the products that they're in are washed directly down the drain. And as Rolf may hit on, wastewater treatment plants are really not designed to remove quacks. They're not designed to remove most of the synthetic chemicals that we use. Um, and so removal in wastewater treatment plants can vary depending on the subclass. But even if the removal is decently high, these chemicals are used so much that even if a small percentage gets through, it still represents a pretty significant loading to the aquatic environment. Um, and there is some data on concentrations in the aquatic environment. But overall, I would say that data on the exposure to quacks um, in both the indoor and the outdoor environment is very limited. Um, and also on the human side, you know, any kind of biomonitoring data um, is also limited. And that's something that might get helped with the biomonitoring California work. So a kind of interesting case study that I wanted to highlight is um, that combines the toxicology and the exposure is Terry Hrubick from Virginia Tech. Um, <clears throat> she presented at this Biomonitoring California meeting. And um, like I said, I'm not a toxicologist. I'm just going to provide a high level overview of what she's talked about. But I thought it was really interesting. So she's a professor for anatomical sciences there. Um, and she's not really, it doesn't seem in the practice of doing, you know, hardcore focused chemical toxicity studies it, um, as part of her work. She teaches like anatomy lab. Um, but she started noticing that the mice in the study that she was working on started developing neural tube birth defects and had a decrease in the number of mouse pups born. And they couldn't figure out why. Nothing had changed in their lab, none of their handling procedures, and they just couldn't figure out why they were all of a sudden seeing these impacts. And they eventually were able to trace it to the fact that the um, building that they were in, they had switched the disinfectant to one that contained quacks. And this disinfectant was being used um, to clean the inside of the labs, the cages, and then it, it sounds like the, the researchers were cleaning their hands with it, or at least their gloves with it, before they reached in and touched the mice. Um, and what's really interesting about that is that they, these mice weren't being dosed. They were just in a room or in an environment where there was quacks all around them and they were seeing these impacts. 
um, and she did some more studies and um, found multi-generational impacts from this exposure to these quacks that persisted down to the F2 generation. They saw neuro neural tube defects from both male and female exposure, so either one um, resulted in those defects in the young. And they found declines in female and male fertility. And another really, I thought, interesting point was that when she was trying to do her control studies, the only way for them to um, get a control that was completely free of quacks was to move to a completely different building that did not use quacks in their disinfectants. Because when they tried to do it in their building, even trying as much as they could to not expose the animals to quacks, the quacks were still there um, because they are so sticky and they, they do stick around. She did a little bit of work with humans and she, looks at, she looked at quacks on hands from hand wipes and also in blood. And she found that when quacks were in blood, <clears throat> it was associated with increased markers of inflammation, decreased mitochondrial function, and altered cholesterol synthesis, which she indicated um, can be associated with disorders such as obesity, diabetes, autoimmune disorders, asthma, allergy, autism, a whole host of things that are of concern. So I just thought that was a really interesting um, kind of case study about studying quacks. And like I said, you can go to the Biomonitoring California meeting page and find her slides. So then just to end, I wanted to kind of discuss a couple of the challenges that I see associated with quacks that um, might be some good conversation starters. So the first is um, that a lot of the predictive tools, models, and even standard measurements that we use to characterize and understand chemicals are not sufficient to handle these big complicated structures like quacks and the, the different ways that they behave in the environment relative to the normal chemicals that we might be used to. Um, so an example of that is the octanol water partition coefficient, um, which is really just not even applicable to some of these really big compounds. And that, that's a sta um, something that's used to better understand potential for bioaccumulation and hydrophobicity. And um, so those aren't always possible to use for these compounds. And but they're also really hard to measure analytically. Um, I don't see them in a lot of these non-targeted surveys of either the indoor or the outdoor environment. And I think a lot of times they're missed because they are so hard to detect or to pick up on the, um, some of those more standard um, scans. And they can also have really high blanks, um, which can be quite the challenge, I found myself. Um, and then finally, um, Ted kind of alluded to this, but sometimes the alternatives that we know do exist don't actually work in all scenarios. So Robert Harrison um, of California Department of Public Health and UCSF spoke at this Biomonitoring California meeting and he highlighted the fact that things like hydrogen peroxide, which might be a great alternative, can actually degrade medical equipment. So it can't be used in those situations. So it brings up the question of when might the use of quacks be warranted or be necessary in something like a hospital situation or where we are now in this global pandemic where it literally might be saving lives um, and how do you balance that against the risks and concerns associated with them. So with that, I'll end um, and my contact information is here. Feel free to reach out. And just once again, point to that Biomonitoring California March 2020 meeting page. It's got a lot of great information and hopefully soon we'll also have the, um, the transcript from the meeting. So with that, um, thanks so much and look forward to the discussion.